Good afternoon. It's Thursday, September 23rd, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Spokane area, welcome to our 2021 General Election Candidate Forum featuring candidates for Spokane City Council District 1 Position 2. City Council District 1 is the northeast portion of the city, generally north of I-90 and east of Division. I am Lisa Kuhar, your moderator, and Mike Bell of the League is the timer. Election Day for the 2021 general election is Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021. Ballots will be mailed to all registered voters about three weeks before election day and must be postmarked or deposited in conveniently located ballot boxes no later than 8 p.m. on election day. You can register to vote by mail or online by October 25th, 2021 or in person on election day at the Spokane County Elections Office at 1033 West Gardner Avenue or at Center Place 2426 North Discovery Place, Spokane Valley. For other questions about casting your ballot or information about the candidates, contact the Spokane County Elections Office at 509-477-2320 or visit their website, spokanecounty.org slash elections or on the League of Women Voters online voters guide, vote411 at vote411.org. I will be asking the candidates questions that have been formulated by the League's Voter Services Committee and will ask as many questions as time allows. Before the questions begin, the candidates will have up to 30 seconds to introduce themselves and tell the voters why they are running. They will have up to one minute to answer each question with additional time for rebuttal or a follow-up question as appropriate. And each candidate will have the opportunity for a 30 second closing statement. The first speaker will alternate with each question. Now I will, will introduce the candidates. They are Jonathan Bingle and Nagmana Shirazi. Starting with you, candidate Bingle, you'll have 30 seconds to tell us why you're running for Spokane City Council. Yes, well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters for for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, you know, my name is Jonathan. I'm born and raised in Spokane. I went to Rogers High School. My wife and I we own a couple small businesses here uh, in the city of Spokane, and now I'm running for city council because I just want to try and bring back some common sense to our city council. Try to help Spokane become the safest and the cleanest city that it can be. So. Thank you, candidate Bingo. Now, candidate Shirazi, why are you running for city council? Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to meet everybody. My name is Narmana Shirazi. I am an immigrant. I'm a, a resident of Spokane for the last 10 years. Single mom, I am an educator, I'm a scientist, lots of intersectionalities to me. And I am running because I have lived in the Northeast District of Spokane for the last 10 years and not seen very much happening here. And so I want to make sure that voices like mine, people who are struggling to put food on the table are carried to Spokane City Council along with me. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Shirazi. Okay, first question does go to candidate Shirazi. As housing prices rise, so does the cost of owning or renting houses or apartments. What should the city do to encourage more affordable housing in Spokane for people who have been priced out of the housing market? So one issue that I've noticed is mainly that I, for instance, am working full 40 hours a week, sometimes I have to go find a second and third job just to make ends meet, despite having four degrees. And uh, I work very hard and yet I'm finding it a struggle to make ends meet and pay all my bills on time. So I'm lived that with that one missed paycheck away from being on the street. So there are a lot of people like me who are in that same situation, can't find a mortgage, can't find the home, homes that we want to move into. We need to build, we need to be upzoning, we need to be rezoning to provide space for people to move in together so that there is stock available for people to be able to live. We want to, we need to create stability so that people are housed. We need to be able to, with the, with the uh, federal dollars that are coming our way, we want to make sure that people are stable in their home living conditions that so that they stay housed. It is a people person uh, a problem. It is a human problem. It is people like me who are suffering. So we need to do something right now. Thank you. Uh, candidate Bingo, same question. As housing prices rise, so does the cost of owning or renting houses or apartments. What should the city do to encourage more affordable housing in Spokane for people who have been priced out of the housing market? 
Yeah, we've seen, uh, you know, housing uh, in the city of Spokane in the last few years rise pretty dramatically. Uh, one of the things I hear most often when I'm, uh, you know, out uh, knocking on doors um, is how much people's rent have gone up, uh, you know, in the last in the last few months. And I was speaking to a woman named Lisa yesterday. She told me that her rent is going to rise five hundred dollars a month, uh, which is six thousand dollars a year. And she's she's on a fixed income. And uh, a, a, a rise in rent that drastic is something that absolutely has the ability to push people out of their homes. And that's that's a real tragedy. Uh, I'm thankful that I've been endorsed by the Home Builders Association, by the Association of Builders and Contractors, uh, Association of General Contractors. Um, I'm a general contractor myself. I understand what we need. And what we need right now is we just need supply. We need the city to stop voting down developments. That's one of my biggest frustrations with the city council right now. We need to make sure that we're making uh, housing types like we see in Kennel Yards legal in the entire city and not just in special zones. And uh, like I said, we just need to increase the supply and we need to do it now. Thank you. Uh, question number two, we'll start with candidate Bengal. As the population of the city of Spokane continues to grow, what measures will you support for reasonable development and its impact on traffic, school bonds, water use, et cetera? Yeah, so traffic uh, usage is a is a big deal. So um, we have some areas in the city of Spokane that are that are growing faster than others. We have some areas where jobs are growing faster than others. For example, uh, in the West Plains, we have about 12,000 people that live um, in the West Plains. However, 90% of the people that work in the West Plains don't live there because the housing supply doesn't exist in the West Plains. That means that we have over 10,000 people every day commuting to the West Plains. Now we know that uh, uh, carbon emissions are, are uh, higher than they should be because we don't have housing available. There's wear and tear on the streets because uh, again, housing isn't available. Um, the, one of my biggest priorities when I first uh, uh, get elected, if I were to be elected, was again, to make sure that we are really hyper-focused on increasing the supply of housing uh, because it not only affects people's bottom line, but it affects you know the wear and tear on the streets, it affects the environment, and we need to make sure that we're being uh, the best stewards of everything that, we're, that we've been given. Thank you. Candidate Shirazi, same question. As the population of the city of Spokane continues to grow, what measures will you support for reasonable development and its impact on traffic, school bonds, water use, et cetera? We've already seen that District 1 is the largest generator of sales tax, and that's because the largest amount of businesses are in our area. Once this North-South Freeway ends up being finished, built, being built, we will have growth mushrooming overnight. We need to have the 61 miles of unpaved streets and roads in my district, for instance, we need those to be done. We need to be ready for that development to be happening. We need water and sewage and infrastructure connections and everything ready to be able to welcome those small businesses in our area so that we can continue to provide jobs and growth. From there on, once we're done with rezoning once we are done with the city being infill and density and so the population growth is effective the way it is the way that it needs to be i am very much in favor of the new that uh, no, the central city line it's supposed to stop at the spokane community college right now i'd like to see it go through the entire city i've lived and worked on four different continents and i've seen this work if we have that central beltway it will work well to help people commute thank you Kenneth Shirazi, questions three starts with you. The issue of homelessness continues to be a major problem in Spokane. Yet in the last few months, employees have resigned from the Community Housing and Human Services Department. How can the city council work with the city to address staffing resignations and still accomplish all of the needed work relating to increasing the number of beds in existing low barrier shelters and addressing the spread of encampments to residential neighborhoods? City Council is already working on it. I have seen just in the recent days, um, there were some approvals where they've approved proactively for once, thank goodness, um, some shelters which are low barrier shelters and will be according, uh, adding to the number of beds available. We do, I do have concerns about all the money that the mayor just returned uh, about, you know, not being able to fill all the positions that are needed to be filled with people that need to work in those areas. 
I mean, I wish somebody would call me and say, Nakmana, we have a job for you, come do it. You know, I'll happily take it up. You know, why did we have to return a million dollars to the federal government because we weren't able to fill those positions? So we have the money, why aren't we getting the people? We, do we need to look at, at our own selves in the city by, with the racial equity lens, what's the situation? I think that's the first thing we need to be looking at. And then we need to be talking about what we are doing, uh, doing outside in the city, because obviously we can't do anything unless we have the people. We don't have the workforce. We can't do anything. We need to fill those positions. Thank you. Candidate Bengal, same question. The issue of homelessness continues to be a major problem in Spokane. Yet in the last few months, employees have resigned from the Community Housing and Human Services Department. How can the City Council work with the city to address staffing resignations and still accomplish all of the needed work related to increasing the number of beds in existing low barrier shelters and addressing the spread of encampments to residential neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I I know that the the topic of homelessness is a very complex one, and I I um, I know that some have left because they just felt as if the city had too much red tape. It was too difficult to get anything done to actually be effective. So I know many of them have left and gone to work for um, private organizations or nonprofits. And one of the things that I think that the city council could do best is actually start to um, establish some good policies when it comes to um, homelessness. I think with some really good intentions, we've had some really bad policies passed that aren't actually helping people transition from being homeless into self-sustainable again. Um, the policies that I would promote would be those that are focused on the individual because we know that homelessness is less a housing issue and more a human issue. Um, most of our chronically homeless in the city of Spokane are overwhelmingly addicted to a substance or alcohol or mentally ill. So I want to support programs that are actually taking people from brokenness into healing uh, to make sure that we can help them to be self-sustainable again. And I think with policies that are effective like that, we'll have less staffing shortages at the city. Thank you. Question four. Next year, the city of Spokane will be eligible for an additional $40 million from the federal government for COVID response. How would you propose this money be spent? Candidate Bingle? Yeah, $40 million sounds like a lot of money, and it, it really is. Uh, but when you're talking about a $1 billion annual budget at the city, $40 million can go pretty quickly. And so what, what the $40 million is designated for is what we need to make sure that we're hyper-focused in, um, in its dispersal. So we need to make sure first that um, people who are uh, far behind on their rent um, are, not, are not losing their homes. Um, as the eviction moratorium gets raised, um, one of the things that we could see if we're not careful is we could see, uh, you know, mass evictions, and that would be really bad for our community, particularly in the Northeast when we know people are pretty behind on their on their utilities. That's a pretty good indicator that they're also behind on their rents. We need to make sure that uh, tenants aren't going to lose their housing. We need to make sure that uh, the industries in the city of Spokane that have been affected most, such as restaurants, um, are taken care of, that uh, they're um, they're receiving their share of those funds to to stay uh, to stay open. And finally, any, any money that is left over, we need to make sure that uh, what we're using it on is only a one-time spend and that we're not creating programs that are gonna create future tax burdens for, for taxpayers in the city. Thank you. Candidate Shirazi, same question. Next year, the city of Spokane will be eligible for an additional $40 million from the federal government for COVID response. How would you propose this money be spent? It's actually 84 million, but you know, right now we only have a plan of uh, getting 40 million, which I, I don't even understand why it's taken a whole freaking year to get to us. We, our people need it now, especially in District One. You know, we have this huge shortage of uh, funds. Our 30 percent of our businesses have gone under. We have people who need rent and utility assistance right now. We need people who need recovery from. COVID-19, whether it's vaccines or in any, which, whichever shape or form, we really need to take off the care of the people who are hurting right now. That's got to be the focus. Then, of course, we need to make sure people get back to work safely, which means we need to invest in our, whether we're helping with mortgages or rent, that needs to be, rent and utility assistance needs to be the first priority, whether it's for businesses or whether it's for people, and get people back to work safely so that we can go back to work and thrive, bring that money back in and so that our families can thrive. That, I think, is the biggest priority for me. And in the long term, it'll help save us money if we, do, if we spend the money to take care of our people now. Thank you. Kennedy Shirazi, question five. The Spokane County Board of Commissioners officially reestablished the Spokane Regional Law and Justice Council on June 29th, reducing the size of the Advisory Council from 25 to 18 and establishing a racial equity committee 
as well as reducing the City of Spokane involvement. Given the changes in the Spokane Regional Law and Justice Council, how will you as a city council member address the disproportional impact of the justice system on people of color? What initiatives do you propose to create a fair, just and equitable criminal justice system? As you know, I, as you can see, I'm a person of color and I do represent a lot of different community organizations. And of course, we are not happy with this whole situation, the way it's evolved. I feel just relegating, um, taking people away from the main body and then relegating it to a small subcommittee, which will in turn feed information so that other people can make decisions on that. I don't think that's a good idea at all. I'm not for it. But at the end of the day, if that's all we have to work with, we need more community engagement. We need more people to stand up and be involved. We need voices to be heard so that we can say what we need to say and for it to be taken seriously. If we major stakeholders come together and what we are working on it, then what we say, how we present it, how it's taken, it needs to land not on deaf ears. I think people need to come to the table ready to be heard or hear actually, and so that we can come to a proper solution on this. I'll work my best I'll do my best as a with a racial equity lens. Thank you. Candidate Bingo, same question. The Spokane County Board of Commissioners officially reestablished the Spokane Regional Law and Justice Council on June 29th, reducing the size of the advisory council from 25 to 18 and establishing a racial equity committee, as well as reducing the city of Spokane involvement. Given the changes in the Spokane Regional Law and Justice Council, how will you as a city council member address the disproportional impact of the justice system on people of color? What initiatives do you propose to create a fair and just and equitable criminal justice system? Yeah, well, one of the things that I've, I've really appreciated um, over the years is getting to know many, many people on that, uh, on that board, um, you know, people who are um, proposing this change. So first off, by law, the, the number that we have to have is 13. Reducing it from 25 to 18 still keeps us with uh, with five people over what law uh, what what the law requires. 18 members on a board is is a lot of people. Uh, for people who've been involved in organizations, trying to get a board of 25 people to to agree on anything is very very difficult. Um, I I I have um, over the course of the of the last couple of months um, enjoyed talking to the the experts in this area, the people who are actually. Uh, 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 creating policy here. And what they have proposed is that we reduce it from 25 to 18 to actually make this board more effective and more efficient, more streamlined to where they can actually do more and provide more solutions for this community. And so I'm thankful for those people who are who are proposing these, these changes and I would, I would support it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question six, do you- can May I use my up? rebuttal over here? Yes, please. Okay, I, I appreciate what you said, Jonathan. I think that's a great idea that you know you had these conversations with folks on the board and that's what they're saying. But reducing the number, what it means is that you're not getting all fair representation from all across the board. You're not getting people who are talking about what their needs are. You're not listening to the folks who really need to have their say. You're not listening or they're not being heard. So it's really important that we get fair representation, we get all the voices to the table. That's really, really important. And that's that I think is key to making sure this, the criminal justice system works in our city. Thank you. Uh, Candidate Bengal, would you like to respond to that? Yes, please. Um, so the thing is, is that uh, you're obviously reducing the number of people on the board from 25 to 18, uh, which is, uh, you know, removing seven people from that from that conversation that does not mean that anybody is losing representation you look at the the people who have to be on that board the people who have been selected uh, the citizen oversight that is on that board um, it is it is still a very well represented and well-rounded uh, board that does allow for every single stakeholder every single group in this community to be represented and if it makes it to where they're actually going to be more effective and it creates a more streamlined process uh, where people are getting more done I think it's better for the community. Thank you, candidates. Okay, we'll move to question six. That was, that was a good discussion, thank you. Um, and candidate Bengal, you'll be first here. City Council created the Spokane Action Subcommittee in early 2019 in order to focus on issues surrounding climate change and its effects on Spokane and the region. 
The group is working to release the final plan for council consideration this fall. What are your thoughts on efforts that the city of Spokane can be implementing as we experience increasing climate changes in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, it's a it's a great discussion. It's one of the the big issues of our time is the is the issue of climate change. And uh, you know, I I sit here and I think about my son and I think, what's the world that I want him to take over? And the world that I want him to take over, you know, is a is a green and and healthy earth. Uh, in the city of Spokane, we have a, a tremendous tremendous resource at our disposal, which is the river running through it. And I want to make sure that that river is cleaner um, and better for future generations. Um, and so I think it's an important conversation to have. Some of the issues in the sustainable action plan, I disagree with pretty strongly. For example, one of the things that they've been trying to do that they just uh, removed, but it still gives me concern for the future, um, depending on this city council, is that they've been wanting to ban natural gas, which I think is a really bad idea. Natural gas is one of the main reasons why the United States was able to lower its uh, net carbon emissions uh, in the last couple of years, while other other uh, you know uh, countries in the Paris Accords weren't able to, and it will significantly increase the price of utilities for people in my district who already are you know well behind on their utility payments. Um, so I've got some concerns with it. Thank you, Kenneth Shirazi. City Council created the Spokane Action Subcommittee in early 2019 in order to focus on issues surrounding climate change and its effects on Spokane and the region. The group is working to release the final plan for council consideration this fall. What are your thoughts on efforts that the city of Spokane can be implementing as we experience increasing climate changes in the Pacific Northwest? So I consider myself very, very lucky that when I decided to move to the United States as an immigrant, I came to live in the state of Washington. Um, I feel our progressive policies and our green policies are so much further ahead than the rest of the nation. We are already well on our way to becoming carbon neutral. We've already made these um, uh, decisions. And with city council and President Beggs coming up with these ideas around the sustainability and climate action plan, um, I know that they've set aside a lot of money and there's a lot of work going into uh, talking and finding out from folks from different from across the board by people who are actually affected by daily living, what what it constitutes to them or what it means to them and how they're going to be affected. There are surveys out there that I'm actually on one of the committees and helping to bring it all together. And we're working on it to ask people what the needs are right now. But having uh, putting in buses that are uh, less carbon emission uh, or carbon emission free and things like that, these are initial uh, changes that we're looking forward to. Thank you. Uh, question seven is a very specific one for you in the Northeast. Children of the Sun Trail paralleling the new North Spokane Quarter is in the process of being built with state highway funds. Additional projects connecting the trail would enhance its use. Uh, that would enhance its use have been identified by community groups though these have not been funded. How should the city facilitate these additional projects? Starting with you, candidate Shirazi. So right now, for better or worse, there are so many COVID related funds available. There are so many grants available. And I believe that having the foresight to use this time and space and money to actually get the uh, get really a proper funding source for our city parks and uh, recreational uh, trails and things like that. Uh, and, and Children of the Sun Trail can be developed using some of that money if we are clever about it and how we use it. Of course, the majority of the money has to go to all our health and human services and getting our city back on its feet again. But if there is an opportunity where we have money like that available, uh, I think that's where we need to look for and we can find it. Um, there's a lo there's lots of, lots of money. I mean, whether it's to do with, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? So, uh, the green canopy, you know, so being green, uh, having parks and things, the same thing is important in this way that we can we can continue to do that and um, use that to our advantage. Thank you. Candidate Bingo, same question. Children of the Sun Trail paralleling the new North Spokane Corridor is in the process of being built with state highway funds. Additional projects connecting the trail that would enhance its use have been identified by community groups, so these have not been funded. How should the city facilitate these additional projects? Yeah, so I know as the North South Corridor is is being finished that this is going to be a huge boon for our area. 
Um, and I know that uh, eventually the land um, on, on either side of the uh, of the North-South Freeway is going to be parceled off. It's going to be sold to small business owners. It's going to be sold uh, to, to developers to develop and, and create communities around it. And so as we are, are building this uh, North-South Freeway, which again will be a massive boost for uh, the Northeast, we need to make sure that uh, you know, side projects, walking trails, uh, things like that are, are incorporated so long as first and foremost, uh, the road and everything is functional and usable. It needs to be created with that in mind, it is first and foremost a corridor for vehicles uh, to help uh, vehicles reduce the strain on our other streets, on our other major thoroughfares that are going north south. And so, while I support the the addition of the of the auxiliary, um, uh, you know, additions to the uh, to the trail, I need to make sure that the that the north south corridor first and foremost is functional and usable for everybody. Thank you. Question eight, due to construction of the North Spokane corridor, the Minnehaha neighborhood, which is mostly east of the new freeway, will be nearly cut off from the rest of the city with a permanent closure of several major streets. What could the city do to mitigate the inconvenience to this neighborhood? Candidate Bengal, you're first. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can see that uh, you know I ninety goes right straight through the the heart of the city, and uh, it hasn't cut anybody off. As a matter of fact, it's made it to where uh, you know communities that might have been away from better services or things like that are actually more connected. Well, you know, it may physically have uh, have something separating it. It's not actually going to be separated from the city. Uh, the North South Corridor is going to help connect it to the rest of the city um, more than anything else. And um, I've been through the the Minnehaha neighborhood uh, quite a bit been uh, speaking to that, uh, um, uh, you know, that community for the last few days. And when they're talking about the North-South Corridor, mostly what they're, they're concerned with is how high is this wall going to be? What is the sound going to be like? Are we, are we thinking about how graffiti is going to be um, affected um, in, this, in this place? As I'm talking to everybody, they seem to be excited about the North-South Corridor. And I don't believe that anybody there is, is anything but excited. And I don't think they're worried about being separated from the city because they're not being separated from the city. They're actually uh, getting better connections to the city. Thank you. Can candidate Shirazi, same question. Due to the construction of the North Spokane Corridor, the Minnehaha neighborhood, which is mostly east of the new freeway, will be nearly cut off from the rest of the city with the permanent closure of several major streets. What could the city do to mitigate the inconvenience to this neighborhood? Nearly connect, nearly cut off is exactly right. And there are a lot of people there that I've been speaking to who are very concerned about this because not everybody wants to get in a car and get on the freeway. They just want to make sure that their bikeability or their, their pedestrian use is um, amplified or at least at the bare minimum kept to where it is at. So one way, one thing that we can do is to make sure that we have the green spaces designated, we have amenities designated, you know, whether there is children's parks or whether we are making new murals or um, creating an environment where people are able to walk down the road and get what they need that i think is the is the key to making them feel that their you know their community is intact there's a library whatever it is that they need i think that's that's important uh, to make sure that that feeling of community is maintained um so i i would be looking to see how we can enhance that experience for them thank you very much Candidate Shirazi, question nine, how should the city prioritize and find the money for improved road maintenance for residential neighborhoods? Could you repeat again, sorry? How should the city prioritize and find the money for improved road maintenance for residential neighborhoods? Well, as I said earlier, we have so much uh, federal grant money coming our way. Once we figure out what is really needed for the city, I think it is. it ought to be a priority. As I said, 61 miles of unpaved streets and road in my district. Why isn't more being done, has been done in, since the 1920s, how it was zoned to be work and live in the same place kind of a, a thing for, for folks. And um, so we have this opportunity where we can allocate funds for very many different uses. And there's a lot, $84 million is just one part of the, of the deal. There is a whole lot more in the pipeline that's on its way. If we are smart, we can get our city set up where it is ready for use in the future. It is the largest city between, uh, bit, there is no other large city between Spokane and Minnesota. So, you know, literally we have so much going for us and we, within this, area we have so much that we can develop Spokane to be uh, whatever we need it to be. It's a great opportunity. Thank you. 
Candidate Bengo, how should the city prioritize and find the money for improved road maintenance for residential neighborhoods? Yeah, well, uh, the thing that we know is that local government really exists for, for two main functions, which are public safety and infrastructure. So those are the things that should be our highest priorities whenever we're putting together budgets, whenever we're working out future plans, whenever we're thinking, you know, casting vision for the future, public safety and infrastructure have to be um, our top priorities. So if there are uh, other dollars being spent in the city that aren't one of those two priorities, one of the things we need to make sure is that we're, we're directing it uh, there as much as possible. Unfortunately, with most of that money that's coming in from the federal government, uh, I believe all of it, uh, we cannot use it on infrastructure uh, projects. And so that will make it to where we can't actually use that money on roads. Um, one of the things that we do know is that we have some bonds that are falling off in about 2030. Uh, so making sure that we can plan ahead and be ready for when the time comes that the city has the ability uh, you know, to potentially borrow some money and put it into our roads. I think that's something that we need to be focused on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Candidate Bingle, how would you address the public safety concerns many people have about the concentrations of homeless people in or near downtown? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time for me? How would you address the public safety concerns many people have about the concentrations of homeless people in or near downtown? Yeah, so I mean, those are those are real concerns, you know. Um, I speak to people all day long when I'm talking to them and they just, you know, downtown is a place that they don't want to go uh, because again, what, what we have downtown is a concentration of our chronically homeless population. And with our chronically homeless population, again, we find overwhelming addic uh, addiction or mental health uh, issues. And uh, what happens is, you know, a family when they're down there, uh, they, they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel safe because of the volatility of some individuals that are down there. One of the things that we need to do is we need to start, um, start moving services outside of downtown. We need to start putting them closer to the, uh, to the edge of the city. We need to start spreading them out, not just in downtown. We need to spread them out across the city uh, because we have, uh, we've concentrated all of our services downtown. Um, and unfortunately, what ends up happening is then we get a, a concentration of, of the chronically homeless downtown. And uh, right now we have a downtown with a 25% vacancy in our, um, in our office and commercial spaces. And uh, if we don't have businesses that are wanting to invest downtown, we can have a city that's actually dying because it centers its main center is is um is dying thank you mm -hmm. uh candidate shirazi how would you address the public safety concerns many people have about the concentrations of homeless people in or near downtown so whether it's downtown or whether it's in any part of the city we need to make sure that we have services of all kinds available uh, that are associated with the shelters that we put in place um if people can be taken care of where they are, if we can keep people in their homes and not have them evicted, we are going to be able to uh, lower the number of people going, uh, becoming homeless. And, you know, we can create stability to keep them housed. We will have not have this pro problem with our unhoused neighbors. And so whether it's downtown or whether it's anywhere else in the city, we just need to make sure that we have resources available so that people can be where they are taken care of and they don't have to go too far away to look for services. Thank you. Kenneth Shirazi, what is the best way to fund and prioritize better code enforcement for such issues as the abandoned vehicles and motor homes increasingly found in neighborhoods throughout the city? I remember you asked this question during our primary as well. And my, it, again, it boils down to, you know, the city making sure that, you know, once we're ticketing uh, abandoned vehicles, you know, first and foremost, why are they there? You know, we need to look a little bit more into, do a little bit more research into why is this happening? Is, is this because of homelessness? And if that is the case, then again, this is, uh, as, as we said earlier, this, is, this whole situation is so complex. There's so many reasons why these things happen. So we, of course, you know, maybe, apply our ordinances a bit more stringently and definitely get input from neighborhood councils to see what creative solutions they have so that we can look into it because it's not city-wide necessarily. It's not every single locality. It is a problem in certain areas and we really need to look and see why it's happening in those areas. Thank you. Candidate Bingo, what's the best way to fund and prioritize better code enforcement for such issues as the abandoned vehicles and motorhomes increasingly found in neighborhoods throughout the city. 
Yeah, again, I think, again, it's just prioritizing our dollars into uh, things that that government exists for and public safety is a big one. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I've been endorsed by the Spokane Police Guild and by the sheriff, uh, because I think that they understand that um, that I realize that, um, uh, you know, I have the best ideas to bring um, when it comes to the idea of public safety. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, abandoned vehicles on streets, I hear this quite a lot, you know. Um, vehicles are, are, are coming and, and very rarely going. They're, they come into a neighborhood, they get left there, they're abandoned. Uh, people are calling and they can't get anybody to come out. And that's largely because we don't have uh, the code enforcement uh, team necessary uh, to be able to get out there and, and respond to all of the calls. Uh, you know, I've, I've gone on police ride-alongs and you see how they have to uh, prioritize the calls that are coming in. Um, and it's the same with code enforcement. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to um, pretty drastically increase the budget when it comes to um, police and public safety uh, in our city. And that's what I would support. Thank you. Our last question, we'll start with you, Candidate Bingle. The City Parks and Recreation Department has recently completed a community survey. What is your vision for future parks and recreational areas in Spokane? I love parks. So I grew up at Friendship Park. Um, one of my favorite things was in the summertime, you know, school was out um, in the morning times. We would run over to, uh, we would run over to the park or more likely, sorry, mom, if you're watching this, my mom would send us to the park and then we would go over there. We would get breakfast. We would get lunch. We'd hang out there all day. Uh, you know, the community was there. Our friends and our family were there. The park was the place to be. It was, it was one of my favorite places. Uh, the Northeast actually is the only district that doesn't have a major park. Uh, one of the things that I would like to see is I would like to see a major park built uh, in the Northeast. That way we don't have to drive all the way down to Manitou or to uh, Riverfront Park, but we can have something that's close to us. Uh, parks to me are a really big deal. But also one of the things that I know is that my wife sometimes really hates to take our son to the park. And that's because, I mean, we find needles. We find scary things at the park. And so it's not always safe for children. And I wanna make sure that again, what we have before we have more parks is I wanna make sure that the parks that we have are clean and safe for families to go and enjoy. Thank you, candidate Shirazi. The city's park and recreation department has recently completed a community survey. What is your vision for future parks and recreational areas in Spokane? So saying that we don't have a big park in, in District 1 is exactly right. I would love to see a large park built in Chief Gary Park neighborhood or Minnehaha for that matter. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I live up north, right up north. So I know that there isn't anything nearby. We have lots of space. We can we can build some, uh, houses here. We can have the localities. Definitely the survey shows that there is a big need. And I know that we've had all kinds of discussions at the, the city council uh, 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 meetings at the neighborhood neighborhood council meetings where, you know, we've talked about, oh, we want to see, people would like to see a water park or, you know, where, where it's nice to say, take kids to play during the day in the summertime. I think those are great ideas and there are definitely funds already set aside for that. Um, there are certain, uh, areas that are uh, designated for this. I think that's th the first place to begin with, to at least get those projects moving so that we can have that and our kids can go out and enjoy them. Thank you. And now candidates for your closing statements, you will each have up to 30 seconds and we'll begin with candidate Shirazi. So thank you so much for all your support during the primary. I am now in the general, advanced to the general and uh, with four votes. So, you know, testament to the statement, exactly, testament to the statement that every vote counts. And of course, Jonathan, I'm gonna beat you with a landslide this time. Just kidding. It's, it's all with love, said with love. And uh, so at the end of the day though, um, please vote for me, support me, go to my website. I need your money to be able to come through and we wanna see me in position. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Shirazi. Candidate Bengal, you have 30 seconds for your closing remarks. Yeah. Well, thank you again to the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Lisa, you did a great job. Thank you, Nagmana, for being here. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to sit here and talk about the city with you. Um, I, I, I would also love to have your vote. I think that if your priorities when it comes to looking at the city, if your priorities are uh, you know, uh, enhancing public safety in the city, I think if uh, bringing reasonable homeless solutions uh, to the city is one of your priorities, if housing and business development, if those are your priorities, I believe I'm your candidate and I'd love to have your vote. Thank you, candidate Bingo. This concludes our 2021 general election candidate forum for 
candidates, featuring candidates for Spokane City Council, uh, District 1, Position 2. Jonathan Bingle and Nagmana Sherazi. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, thank you to our candidates for participating in this forum. We hope this has given you, the voters, information that will help you make an informed decision when marking and returning your ballots by 8 p.m. Election Day, Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021. For more information, visit our website, www.lwvspokane.org or our online voters guide, vote411 at vote411.org.